I think the original um, beginning of my interest in science came from having my pram parked under the trees when I was a baby. My mum was a GP in London, uh, a family practice, and so she had to both work and look after me simultaneously. So she parked my pram under the trees, I looked at the trees, and I became inspired by botany. So by the time I was uh, about six months old, I ne needed um, flower flower books read to me. <laughs> My dad said if, if he had to read Flower Fairies of the Spring one more time to me, he was going to scream. <laughs>Well, uh, obviously we're talking today partly about gender and um, I was actually turned down for a job once because I was a woman and nowadays of course you couldn't do this but the, the, uh, the interview that I had, it was for marine biology, it was actually in Portsmouth and the guys uh, on the panel, of course it was guys, uh, they said to me, uh, are you going to be able to carry the boat? Uh, so I said yes and actually um, Afterwards, I got a job where the whole team were women and we all carried the outboard motors uh, and the boat and we all dived together. So I think that kind of um, sexism couldn't occur, to, couldn't occur today. Mm -hmm. In terms of genuinely barriers, um, the barriers were my, caused by myself. I graduated with a 2-2 degree, right. so I couldn't start the PhD that I'd been planning. And that's entirely my own fault, but I did learn a few other things in university, like how to have parties. And um, <laughs> it's come in very handy, actually. I learned a lot of life skills, yeah. like, you know, how to make good shoe pastry and champagne punches and things like that. And just generally the entertaining skills that took me away from my uh, studies have actually proved to be quite useful in the rest of my life. Well, I think the main thing that I've lost is sleep, um, a lot of it, but actually um, having then had uh, the great pleasure of being able to have a baby, uh, not really needing to sleep much was quite good for when you had a baby. And once she started sleeping again, uh, being able to work at night um, because I was used to not sleeping has been particularly good. I think. I mean, when I first started my PhD in Galway, the, the um, young women who lived in the house with me, they said, uh, how can you do this? How can you leave all your family and friends behind like this? Because they were all, of course, from the local area mm -hmm. and they couldn't really understand how I could just leave everything behind, my, my home, London, my friends, uh, my family. So that, that never was a consideration for me. Mm -hmm. um, that just the things that you don't have, you don't miss. When I went to Canada, again, I left everything behind here and so on. So I wouldn't say I have sacrificed very much, really, um, because it's, it's an obsession and a hobby. You know, you, the work is the work that you love. I think that the, what has been most problematic over the last five years for me is that I, I did go into senior management, that's head of school of a very large school, and that's so demanding uh, in terms of time and energy and also just generally emotionally draining. At the time that I was putting into my research uh, started decreasing to the point that I would actually be thinking, should I actually stop doing my research because I can't do it properly? Uh, any more while doing uh, this other very demanding job. So I am now moving to a job which is even higher up. I'm moving to a dean level job. And uh, I do want to simplify things so that I can do research mm. as well as doing my day job without compromising the quality of each of them. So I want to, I've given up some peripheral activities because I've, I've always tended to be a person who tries to keep actually all of the balls in the air all of the time. And I do see that you will drop some of them, so I'm, I want to simplify a little bit now. Yes, I think they're very, very important. And I think um, what's particularly important is getting kind of messages out and helping people to think about gender. Because when I look at the time that I was appointed in Queens, when I started that lectureship in 1995, there were actually something like two women on the staff two and a half to put it precisely and the half was a shared appointment uh, and when you looked around and they were all men and the students coming through a lot of them were women 
but they're not seeing women in the jobs. So they're thinking, well, I won't have one of those jobs because all the people in those actual academic jobs are men. So I think the, the getting the awareness of what's going on out is just incredibly important. I was just reading about unconscious bias and things like doing image audits, making sure that women are in important roles, they're around the department. If there's pictures out, that those pictures include women, not as women, but as people who are doing their jobs, and some of those people are women. And now, after a few years working with Athena Swan, the, the image audit is like, um, it's something I just do subconsciously all the time. So when I go into the Great Hall now, I go, oh, that's great. We've got another woman up there. We've, you know, we've had several um, important uh, women have been put up on there on the, on the portrait gallery. And actually in Bournemouth, it helped me to get my new job because I went into the vice chancellor's office and um, there were all the portraits of the vice chancellors on the walls and two of them were women. So I said to him, oh, that's great. You've got some women. And he said, uh, Yes, um, and he pointed to the fact that the wall was almost full. He said, I don't know where I'm going to go, probably the toilet. Um, and of course, he was laughing, so I was laughing. I walked into my interview laughing, you know, instead of, as usual, you go in very nervously. So that really did help. <laughs>Yes, um, Swan has been absolutely critical to my career. Uh, it's not what I had planned. I would have, uh, if I had had uh, my own wishes fulfilled, I would have ended up doing full-time research all of the time, being a lecturer. But uh, the Gender Initiative in Queen's gave us a presentation about how there weren't so few women in leadership. That was at a time that it became a particular crisis because there was only one woman head of school in the whole university, and that was nursing. So Margaret Mullet was her name, the Gender Initiatives Director. She showed us the statistics. Now, as we know, women are uh, very uh, evidence-focused, uh, and when we saw the evidence that there are no women in leadership, I thought, well, if I'm not prepared to stand as head of school, how can I criticize the fact that there are no women there? So I agreed to put my name forward for head of school. I felt quite conflicted, <laughs> but I did it. Um, and uh, that was, in other words, my head of school position was a direct result of my in involvement in the gender initiative. Yeah, there's, there's two things that I would like to say to people. And one of them is focus on the positives. It's so easy for us to actually uh, overlook our own achievements and be quite negative about what we've done and always look at the problems, all the things that haven't been done and haven't happened. So there's two ways of, I think, we have to get ourselves into a very positive frame of mind about our own achievements. One thing I've said to younger people is, make your own little hall of fame. Take a cork board or something equivalent and put up the prizes and the papers that you've done and put up the things that allow you to say to yourself, yes, that was me. I did achieve that. If I could change one thing about scientific culture, I think it would be something to do with collegiality versus competition. That there are fields where people naturally tend to collaborate. But then there are other fields where people feel they must compete and even um, try to sort of protect the work that they're not doing. And that there are elements of perhaps even stealing ideas. So I think fortunately, uh, the way that large kind of research projects are going now, there is so much collaboration that that hopefully that area of extreme competitiveness will gradually fade away because yeah, you will be competing with a group in Harvard, but if you're also working with them, then the, the collaborative side of it should make it possible for those um, differences and competitive aspects to be sort of gradually subsumed into a larger uh, process of cooperation. I think big European funding projects, big um, transatlantic funding projects, those help to make things less competitive.